and we are back and my guest is in Elizabeth Irene. How are you? <laughs> I'm excellent, Alva. Thank you. How are you? I am really good and I love the fact I didn't know your name was double barreled. I mean, <laughs> listeners, please, we actually do know each other because we move in the writing circles. I didn't know you had a double barreled name. Simp because when I was younger, I always wanted to have like a you know two names as my first name it was like a big deal for me i know it was a big deal for me as well my my parents probably thought i was going to be the only girl so dad gave me his mom's name mom gave me her mom's name and when my sister came along the names were finished oh so what did she end up with <laughs> she got two american president first ladies names maybe elena maybe oh. eisenhower and elena roosevelt oh. <laughs> And two, she was born too early for a Michelle. Uh, exactly. <laughs> or a Kamala. Oh, my gosh. I know. Okay, fantastic. So how's your week been? My week has been busy, fine, normal, thank God. Um, um, a few, <laughs> yes. I mean, these days you hear things. You hear things happening to those close to you, those you care about. And um, it makes you appreciate a, a normal day. It's yeah it's a it's a strange it's a strange world out there now actually before you came in we actually had a poem on which was complainers and he was talking about people who see the glass half empty you know rather than half full and you know being what's the word um pessimistic mm -hmm. about things or finding things to complain is like you know there are people going through much worse honestly um because if you think about um you, you look at the U.S. at the moment, the way people are just dying. It's, it's awful. It's awful. And then, you know, uh, we, we're in a, a bit of, not to say a lucky situation in Africa, but I think one of the things that we're in a great position for is we see how things happen elsewhere. And where we are then able to take precautions, but I don't know if we're really doing. I, I'm that. not sure. I'm just thinking about that. I, I'm not sure whether we are leveraging on the examples of what has gone on around the world before us. Perhaps we are tough learners or slow learners. I don't know, because um, there, there does seem to be a bit of a disconnect at certain levels. But then that may also be because unless something happens to somebody close to you, it doesn't seem real. It always seems far off. And COVID-19 is probably one of those situations. You mm. may see it happening to people out there. But in Ghana, some of us have had the, the misfortune of seeing people we know, people we care about die. And, and it therefore becomes more real. And if you haven't seen it happen to anybody close to you, it might seem a lot more distant. And that, I think, is the situation we find ourselves in. Do, do you think that um, maybe the way we, um, the way people use religion to, I, I said, <laughs> oh, you know, uh, me, dear, I'm a good Christian and God will not let this thing happen to me. I was talking to like a lady that I buy bread for and she said, eh, because we are God's people. He loves us. <laughs> and, I, and, and I asked her, you think people in other countries don't pray and are yes, not God's yes, people? Yes, this yes. thing is not a God matter. <laughs> you know? I, I, unfortunately, we do tend to do that. I think we recognize that. I, I would like to think that we have a good number of God-fearing people who are, also understand the science and just apply faith with common sense. Mm. W hopefully, <laughs> and that they translate it to the congregation. Exactly. And, you, you know, you're, you're always going to get those ones who say, no, there's nothing, throw your mask away, God is going to help us. You'll always have those. <laughs> yeah, but unfortunately, they are often not the ones who are hit. So then they are able to continue with their delusions. Anyway. Oh, dear. Um, I, and this is to the listeners. Elizabeth and I actually do know each other. She's probably like one of my guests that I actually <laughs> do know previously before coming. We're part of um, a readathon which was set up by um, Nana Redamwa and Kofi Akpabli. They are two amazing guys and they set up this readathon to get 
Ghanaians reading and so they pulled on other authors on board I was the first author called to join them and you know we did Kumasi we did stuff in Accra Elizabeth was one of the authors they got on board Ruby Goka like quite a few authors and we traveled to different parts of Ghana and the crowds really came that and we was would fun go really good crowds coming in just to listen to authors reading and then of course um uh, Kofi and Nana now also have a publishing house, Dapabli Publishers. So if you have a book and you want to, I'm plugging them, but you know, why not? <laughs> They're authors. Um, you know, you can contact them. And then if you're really into books, they also have Book Nook, which is where you can get all your favorite authors to read. So check them out on Facebook. So um, I think we, you know, the readathon got people reading and then also in, encourages people who want to write to also get on with it absolutely and so while we're on this topic of books um every week my guest has to read a from a book that they really enjoy now all my other guests have been artists of other disciplines like painters and music and dancers or whatever but this is the first time i'm having an author so i'm really really interested to know what authors excite you and what authors you like reading so who are you going to read today okay alba today i am going to share a little bit about akwaike's akwaike mezi's book the death of vivek oji okay can you give uh, us a little synopsis of what the book is about the book is about vivek as you can tell the death of vivek oji that sort of gives it away mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's uh it, it, it explores sexuality, it explores identity in a, a form that I am finding so intriguing. A young man, is his mother finds him dead on her doorstep, wrapped in a cloth. That's how the story begins. And, and, and as it unfolds and as it is narrated, you find out what this young man's issues were and how he discovered himself, how other people discovered him, how he grew to love himself and, and how the other people in his life grew to love him the way he was as well. It was written by Akweke Mezi, who uh, had, their personal pronoun is they. So, okay, so he's non-binary. Yeah. Non-binary. Non I'm, okay. I'm very confused. with. I, I, oh. I keep trying to understand that my children keep trying to educate me and I, I keep slipping and forgetting. But Akwaike Mezi refers to themselves as they. Uh -huh. Non-binary, that's the word. Yeah. And um, there, there is, if you, and when you read their bio, there is, there, there, there does seem to be some strong reflection of the author within the book because you will often find that as an author you find you leave yourself but you have in what to. you write you have yes to. yes and it's very if you don't then it's not authentic it's not authentic and this comes across as very authentic which the reader will understand when you go and find out a little bit about the writer and for me i, I find it very brave writing i do not often explore well I, I i shouldn't say often i don't explore themes of sexuality in my writing i write for children and for young adults and there are a, a, a lot of of themes that i would like to explore and i feel that sexuality becomes quite distracting if i include that so i tend to leave that out for personal reasons but i i am thoroughly enjoying this and what i love most is the way the writer is telling their story as somebody who writes stories i am very often interested i'm very interested in how people put their stories together if you don't mind can i read chapter one? Oh, you <laughs> no! i expected you to read you couldn't just come and talk about all the deliciousness of the book and not actually read something to us so please the floor is yours so chapter one i begin mm -hmm. They burned down the market on the day Vivek Oji died. End of chapter one. Excellent. <laughs> I, and but I love that. It's wonderful. It is. It is. because It's, it's, a, it's a bit like a haku, isn't it? Honestly. 
and, and as somebody who tends to have a more tr traditional form of writing, I find this so intriguing as I'm always looking at what other people are doing. And I think, wow, your whole chapter is just one sentence. And of course, at this point, the reader is asking, who is Vivek Uji? Why, why is he dead? Why, and, and well, even why he or she? And, why was he killed? And then, By whom? And for me... What was so significant about, about that the, the market markets. had to be burned yes. down? And one line raises so many questions. They burned down the market on the day Vivek Oji died. Yeah. And, and even though those two sentences might mm -hmm. actually not mm -hmm. be linked mm -hmm. to each Absolutely. other, but you still link them and then it gives, it elevates mm -hmm. the that um, Vivek mm -hmm. into a position of what was so special mm -hmm. about this guy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that a whole market... Mm -hmm had to be raised to, to the exactly, ground. Exactly, exactly. I'll go on to read a little further. I tend to have a more chronological form of, of writing, something that I'd like to play around with a bit because I often have ideas to uh, of p different thoughts about how to present a story but in the actual technical process of writing i do enjoy having everything laid out the way things happen but does is, it, but does that have to do mostly with your audience i don't think so i think the children enjoy because they can do the non-linear back and forth they very can easily. oh very easily absolutely very easy i think that, that just tends to be my style but i'm keen to play around with my style mm -hmm. a bit mm -hmm. because in my head i have different thoughts about how i'd like to present a story in the actual process of writing the story i often go back to what i'm comfortable with and i would like to explore different ways of as you say non-linear non writing so we have i'll read this is probably going to be about a minute's reading vivek is our main character in here and uh right at somewhere in the beginning vivek is very little and i like the way the writer goes back and forth first generation second generation past present telling you a story and still but the thread is there the thread it, is there and it's very effective you don't lose track of what he's saying it all makes sense it all comes together and keeping the keeping the tension in the story when you're revealing so much about the past i think is very very interesting before you start i i i i gave up i've been trying to read a hundred years of solitude <laughs> by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. I think mm -hmm. I've picked it up three times mm -hmm. and I get a third of the way through because it's also another thing. There's a lot of generational stuff, mm -hmm. but they all have the same names. Oh my. So it is Juan Ascension and the, and the names keep on being repeated with slight variations. Oh. So I get completely lost. I don't know where I am if we're talking about the lead characters father or his grandfather or his uncle mm. is very complex mm -hmm, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. i like the fact that you say even though he does the generational mm -hmm. thing you always know where you, you are. always you always know where you're. it's very simply told it's very simply and effectively told so vivek is little vivek is our main character he is found dead on the day the market was burned and we start off with vivek being little and laughing when an, a mechanic is working on his mother's car the mechanic would tease him, small or gah, as his hands moved metal wrenches and tubes and force-fed air. Vivek would giggle and hide his face in his mother's skirt. He was young then, alive. His mother, Kavita, could drop her palm, and it would fall to the back curve of his boy's skull, the soft hair and the warm skin underneath, the formed bone shaping him. Years later, when she found the length of his body stretched out on their front veranda under four yards of aquatic material in a red and black pattern, she said she'd never forget the back of his skull was broken and seeping into her welcome mat. Kavita lifted his neck anyway to press her cheek against his and scream. His hair fell over her arms, wet and long and thick, and she wailed. Yeah. Beta, she screamed, her voice carving the air. Wake up, Beta! One of Vivek's feet was twisted sideways next to a fallen flower pot. Soil spilled around his ankle. Everything smelled of smoke. His shoeless feet revealed the scar on his left instep, a soft starfish colored in deep brown. On the day Vivek was born, his father Chika had held the baby in his arms and stared at that scar. He had seen it before. 
Kavita always commented on his shape whenever she rubbed his mother's feet. Kavita herself had been without a mother for so long, her love for her mother-in-law was tactile, rich, with childlike affection. When Osita was born, Ahuna had wept over his little face, singing to him. She couldn't wait for Kavita's baby to arrive. Now it was a year later, and Chika felt something building in him slowly as he held his newborn son. But he ignored it. These things were stories. They couldn't be real. It wasn't until ne the next day that a messenger came from the village to tell him that his mother had died, that his, his heart ceased. She had been found with her body slumped into her compound. He should have known, Chika told himself, as Kavita screamed in grief, Vivek clutched to her chest. He did know. How else could that scar have entered the world on flesh if it had not left in the first place? Mm. A thing cannot be in two places at once. I saw and the time thing. Exactly, exactly. So we have Vivek lying dead, his mother, in fact we have his mother caressing his head as a child, feeling the softness of his hair, and then years later Vivek is lying dead on her front porch, and she, exactly, she's head. caressing it, and she's looking at his foot, and then his father remembers the foot, and seeing, first the seeing scar. this, exactly, the scar, which was the same scar his mother had, and which um, he noticed when his son was born on the day that his mother died. There's a lot of that in the story, and I think it's so beautiful. Is he Ibo? Ibo, yes. And yeah. um, I think Ibo and um, Tamil, his mother, I think. Oh, their mother is Tamil. and Oh! Yes, their mother is Tamil and father, I think, is Ibo. That's a very interesting combination. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That is... <laughs> wow. So, so um, you talk about... Uh, now I, <laughs> I'm like, give me the book, let me read it. Because I, I like to know... Mm -hmm. It's interesting that... The title is The Death Of, Yes, but it actually feels more like it's The Life Of, doesn't it? Well, the story is about his mother trying to find out why did my son die? Who, who, what happened to him? She found him dead on her front porch. And so he the, was wrapped. He so was obviously wrapped. somebody delivered exactly, him. Exactly, delivered him dead. And for any mother, she would want to find out what happened to my boy. Mm. Mm. Why? Yes, I don't want to give out any spoilers so I won't say ah, too much please, so we won't spoil <laughs> it's, it's absolutely it's absolutely worth the read I'm, I'm definitely do you think I could get it at Vidya or something you like could that? absolutely get this is my husband's book and shout out to my husband for having probably the biggest library I know oh, wow. and I believe he got it from Vidya okay then I'm definitely going to I do really like um, Nigerian writing mm -hmm. I really do like um it's just rich. It's so rich. Excellent, powerful, very intelligent writing. And, you know, I, I've said uh, uh, another one on my bucket list is to go to the Onicha Book Fair. Oh. Because they have this huge literary thing. Wow, you've got to admire the Nigerians. They're absolutely exploding on the literary scheme, as they yes. have for years before, anyway. Yes. I sometimes I comfort myself and say, well, there's so many of them anyway. So Yes, there's, <laughs> a, there's an awful lot of them. But I also think that... Even with, um, like, I, I lived in Lagos for a bit. Okay. And I was staying um, with Yoruba friends. And just even with their, their family and how their culture is a really big deal. It's, it's re very rare for you to meet a Yoruba person with a Western name. I see. You, you Right, right. Actually, now that you mention it, I don't you, think I've ever observed that. It's very weird yes. that you would ever have that mm. i think um for instance because of nollywood a lot of them then started picking names like desmond elliott and rita this and uh, and that but i think most of those guys are actually Igbos. so the Igbos are more into the western but they are also conk <laughs> Igbo uh, right. uh, as well and even staying with my friends i had to learn how to do the curtsies for when you meet somebody who is older mm. or you know they have that little curtsy and yes. then you know the guys do the if they meet some correct baba they will prostrate, They'll prostrate themselves, themselves on the floor if not they touch their ankle mm. which is mm. like the Mm. The modern it's way actually quite being. beautiful to see. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, 
I'm, I'm definitely looking for that book. Thank you very it's much. It's worth the read. And I love the fact that you said we're going into our next musical break and then we're going to come and talk about you and your <laughs> writing and biochemistry, which I just <laughs> recently found out. Um, but why Vic, Vivek? Vivek, what kind of name is Vivek? I'm not sure. I should find out. But anyway, the why Vivek's mother was looking for him mm -hmm. i mean the why is always important is. in any situation listen let's get this biochemistry <laughs> business off and running because i am so fascinated mm -hmm. well a clinical biochemist that's what i do uh, by day it's a job that i love generally the chemistry of our bodies the mm -hmm. way things work um, what's working and what's not working but that's but, an art form as well though isn't it uh, well, I suppose. <laughs> Don't you think that there's art in everything? Uh, there is, if you look closely enough. So, mm. because I want to find a link between the biochemistry <laughs> and... So, but you you knew you were a writer before you did biochemistry. Oh, yes. I mean, before I, I, I didn't know what biochemistry was until I was probably in the higher grades of secondary school. But as a child, the only thing I could conceive spending my time doing was writing and so why the biochemistry as, as you as you grow up you get exposed to different different things mm -hmm. and I, I I went to Achimata school and back then I often think or, or know that your environment shapes you to a large extent and 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 informs the decisions that you make but at the time if you had abilities in the sciences you were always encouraged it's, it, it's still ongoing you know the girl child and sciences and so forth so you're always encouraged to step in and and do some work in the or studying in the sciences that was pretty much the background that i grew up in and mm -hmm. also having a father who was constantly encouraging me with the sciences he was a father who fed my reading habits. My dad plied me with books all the time and would also always say, oh, I think you need to do some work in the sciences. And, and so that was pretty much it. It was school. It was my father's influence. I often ask myself, if I was in an environment where nobody suggested anything, anything to me, I am. You I, just do writing. I, I would just have gone, yes, absolutely. If there had been no suggestion from any quarter whatsoever. But you, you hear things, and when I was about 14 or 13, I had an uncle who said, oh, you want to be a writer, but you must have another profession as well, otherwise you'll be broke for the rest of your life. I was, I was coming to that. I mean, because often when you talk to people from our part of the world, usually parents are not are wary about their Extremely kids going wary. into the arts and are you going to be able to feed yourself are you going to survive yes it's a valid parental concern and of course and some of them too is just that they want doctors in the family is a is a, a pride thing for <laughs> themselves so. yes yes i think the pride thing is there but i'm sure underlying all of that is a parent's desire that the child will be financially secure or stable in mm. future Unfortunately, I feel that our fears often hold us back then because most writers who have made a, a name in, the, in that field would often have left everything behind. A lot of them would have started off, yes, a lot of them would have started off in one field or other, but at some point given it their all. And that's not something that is encouraged in our part of the world, unfortunately. Mm. There's, there's a lot of fear and that fear, it follows you, it flags you and um, sometimes it can, it can slow you down. One interesting thing I read recently was about um, how when COVID hit, there was a huge percentage of people who'd had dreams to do something, do something artistic or start their own business or something. And so this pandemic hit and all these people went, I'm leaving my job. I'm going to, you know, put my all into mm -hmm. this dream mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. mine. And I mm -hmm. found mm -hmm. that really, I found that really intriguing that when things are stable, you've got your job, your monthly salary is coming in and you have this dream, but something is holding you back yeah. from going for it. And then we get slammed with a pandemic where some people were furloughed, lost their jobs. You don't have money coming in. And that's when people creatively mm -hmm, mm -hmm. now 
suddenly became brave and started taking <laughs> risks. I thought that was very, very interesting <laughs> dynamic. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, adversity is and it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful advocate when it comes to change. Mm. <laughs> yes, it's a great instigator of change. Okay, mm -hmm. so you wanted like writing, but you were good at sciences, mm -hmm. so you did the science, mm -hmm. and then at some point. At, at some point you know it it actually never left me alba you just get so consumed with the laboratory aspect of stuff that you end up letting at least i end up, ended up letting the writing drop for a little bit but it never leaves you it's always always there it's always there no but i mean to publish oh yes that's what i'm saying that this was in the, at my earlier days of work mm -hmm. finished university university was it was very consuming so I, I had absolutely no time to write i would scribble things down but never actually constructed a full story it wasn't until after my first child had been born that i thought you know i really want to do some writing Thing. this thing is driving me crazy mm -hmm. because all my, my head was full of stories i'd scribble things down and i'd never like actually done stacks anything of notebooks of oh notes. alba if you understand yeah stacks of notebooks scribbles I'm still, everywhere i'm still doing it oh yes 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 and we'll be doing it till we're <laughs> like Cecily tyson till we go yeah then we'll yes. maybe have something meaningful to say yes yes <laughs> you know so i realized that uh i i still wanted to write it was a big part of who i was i was enjoying my work tremendously as the director of a medical laboratory i had always dreamt as a young child that i would be writing in some sunny meadow somewhere with a shade tree and <laughs> a basket of uh, sumptuous fruit beside me and mm -hmm. uh, write a few lines and pop some fruit or other into my mouth unfortunately life didn't turn out that way it's just a daily all. hustle driving from Dome to Adabraka and working all day and getting home tired and, and you've and got the kids to look after exactly then and, and the family attention absolute. to the husband I mean, absolutely all of that. so you realize you've just got to work with what you have and that's what I do I write at night I often wake up at dawn to make a few notes about my story because I feel very creative at dawn the thoughts just flow that's, through that's the witching hour mm. um it's mm. known as the witching hour mm. and that's the time when the the gateway into mm. the the realms of people could some people say the spirits but I think it's the creative yes. window mm -hmm. opens mm -hmm. up mm -hmm. and so it's an amazing mm -hmm. time to work mm -hmm. because you are your most productive absolutely your 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 You've just woken up. You don't have the stresses of the day yet. You can't hear anybody's voice. And that connection between your self in the physical form and your higher consciousness, uh -huh. it, that gateway is open. That gateway and is it's open. open to what God is telling you. Exactly. you know, I, I feel that we are all called to do different things. We are obviously gifted and different. I couldn't sing to save my life. Me neither. <laughs> but... Uh, I feel that whatever it is God has called you to do, if you if you listen, you get your instructions, but you need to be quiet. And dawn is a that's wonderful why, time to be quiet. And, and that's why meditation is also wonderful because absolutely. it quietens down all the chattering voices to allow the real message to reach absolutely, you. Absolutely, absolutely. And yeah. to meditate, you need some quiet. You need yes. some calm. I... I one of the little issues I have with my beloved Ghana is the noise everywhere. Well, you this know how I do it? I do it through headphones. So, mm -hmm. for instance, I always meditate mm -hmm. to some type mm -hmm. of music mm -hmm. or some type mm -hmm. of chant mm -hmm. um, or like breathing, mm -hmm. you know, where you breathe in positivity mm -hmm. and you exhale negativity. Mm -hmm that kind mm -hmm. of thing but i do it through headphones Absolutely. Yeah. because if not you'll be distracted yes and, and I, I feel that as a nation we often make so much noise that we don't give ourselves enough space for quiet thinking everywhere you go i mean i go and buy fuel there's a loudspeaker there blaring music but I, why but do we need loud loud I, music at a I think fuel we, station i think you need we need loud music because when things are quiet you need to be with yourself mm -hmm. and i think an awful lot of us don't want to be don't want to be with ourselves or are not capable of you know for instance you know um people seem to think that if you are on your own in a space then it means you're lonely no. <laughs> i don't think people mm -hmm. in general mm -hmm are comfortable with just being with themselves I hear as you. they are. I hear you. And so noise is, is a, a device to 
really cover mm. all of those things because and I stop know, you having those conversations because in your I head. know this you do it I do it I know a lot of my friends do it where every so often you keep on asking yourself about what your purpose mm -hmm. is here your journey what is it that you are supposed to mm -hmm. do I don't think an awful lot of people actually take themselves to that space or, or maybe want to be in that space yeah yes I, I see what you're saying but for me it's very important to have times when I'm absolutely quiet yeah. and uh, it's amazing what you hear in your spirit when you're quiet so that's when I write things down I write down ideas for my stories and and sometimes there's a I, I'm at a, a little sticky point in the story and I have several options, you know, how to write my way out of this. And the answers for that often come at dawn. And sometimes I'm scribbling so fast, my hand is shaking. Yeah. yeah but that's Do you do sleep with a notebook by your bed? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> because you, you just know, yes. pop up, you know, <laughs> I know, cause when I wake up, I don't, I don't want to be hunting around looking for my pen and my notebook. It's right beside me. As soon as I get up, it's there. I need it. It's there. I sit down. Sometimes Sometimes no thought comes. And that's okay. And sometimes it's so many thoughts come, like I said, my hand is shaking. And that's the, that's, that's the creative phase. The actual technical writing will come in the evening, usually when I'm tired. But the idea is already there. You just there. let the raw material just pour out. Exactly. And then you start manufacturing. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, so um, I recently did um, shot a documentary and it had to do with agriculture and young people in agriculture. So part of my research was that in 2019, 60% of Africa's population is under the age of 25. Wow, we're blessed. Um, it is going to obviously increase. Um, you deal with young adult fiction. Children and young adults. Yes. Children and young, but young adults specifically is what I'm zooming in for. Right. Simply because this is, I think in Ghana, we have this thing where they're children and they're adults. And then there's that in between. In Ghana, based on the um, census, that um, research that I did, nearly 30% of our population is within that teen range young adults they're mm. young adults on tv there's nothing wow created for them there is nothing on tv that is educational or entertaining for these people to to um tap into right. it's either entertainment shows music shows or it's the telenovelas which are actually not made for that target audience mm -hmm. According to the television report a couple of years ago, 6% um, of programming is targeted at the youth market, but they're all cartoons. So they're, mm. they're not about that young adult market. Mm -hmm. And so I was very interested that that is the market that you are targeting. Mm -hmm. Yes, you do children, but young adults, they've literally, they're literally invisible mm. when it comes into like the media space you don't hear their voices within the economic space, within the political space, unless it's about vote for this party. Wow. But, I mean, or you haven't seen that. I actually didn't notice those statistics. And maybe because I write for them, I, I, I do have them as a focus. Out of the, the seven book is going to be published soon in the US. But out of the seven books that I've written so far, five of them have been young adults. So for me, they're, they're a big part of what I do. And that, uh, I'm me, surprised to hear that. Yeah, I, I'm ve it's very interesting mm -hmm. to me because my background is TV, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Or my background is filmmaking. Mm -hmm. That's what I did before mm -hmm. I fell into writing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I've just recently produced a show for teenage girls. Mm -hmm. I watched, because it's my background, I watch a lot of TV. I watch mm -hmm. a lot of movies. You mm -hmm. don't see them on our wow. TV screens. Wow. There you don't they are not represented, you do not hear their voice. And I think it's amazing that that was what you you zoned in for. Yes, it's 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 a an amazing group to write for. Yes. I feel that as a young adult, you, you you've just you you've stepped over the cusp of childhood and you are approaching the age of greater responsibility and maturity and you don't have that parental 
cage that you had before. Mm -hmm. It leaves you more time to be on your own with your friends, making certain decisions. It's, your, which, it's, a, it's a time of formation. It is. It is. A time of formation. It is. And, this and the thing is, the media plays a big part in that formation mm -hmm. because obviously they are online they watch tv mm -hmm. whatever for me in ghana i don't see them being represented in what they watch oh, that's a pity but 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 mm -hmm. it is it is because mm -hmm. they they are classed as part mm -hmm. of the children oh dear. we mm -hmm. don't we don't we d we think of children and adults we don't actually think of children mm. and that middle yes, band yes there's so much that's going you're discovering so much for yeah. the first time you're offering discovering for the first time who you really are because you often have to make decisions outside your parents uh, control or your parents knowledge and you are associating with people who have mindsets completely different okay. from yours and who are more capable of influencing you because at that age um you're what you're susceptible what, exactly and then and then of course when you have when you're at that age obviously that's when people are also discovering their sexuality yes. and mm -hmm. relationships mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. intimacy mm -hmm. and stuff mm -hmm. and in our part of the world m the vast majority don't have parents who that discussion mm -hmm. can be had mm -hmm. with so then mm -hmm. the next mm -hmm. person mm -hmm. along yes. as you said mm -hmm. is the influencer mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. can lead you either this way or, or that, that way, way or... Yes. yes so for you mm -hmm. why why young adult fiction oh like i said that it, it's such an exciting area to write for there's so much to explore and there's so much freshness there you can as as, as a creative person i can step out and explore themes which may not be suitable for a younger audience. And I'm looking more in terms of who, who are you at this stage? I'm a clinical biochemist, so my life is about testing things. And in life, until you've been tested, you actually don't really know who you are. You know, until you've been faced with, 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 with what your friends are doing, you don't know whether you are going to do. Your parents will tell you one thing: "Oh, don't do this, don't go but there." But until so forth. you're there, that's until when you there. will find yes. out your character. Exactly. And what will you do? And keep away from your parents. And there's so much to explore in that area. It's such rich for the. I, I don't think I could ever run out of stories for that young adult market. It's just an exciting stage of life. So much to explore. That's that's perhaps why I'm so interested in it. Um, when you research. Because obviously you have to research. I am wondering whether I do research, but let me hear you. <laughs> no, I mean, because, uh, for instance, like I have this teen show coming out, but one of the, the first things that I did with a friend was we used to troll the malls and the streets and stop girls and say, if there were a show on TV um, for you as a teenager, what are the things you think should be dealt with? And they gave us a whole range mm. of... And so based on mm -hmm, that... Mm -hmm. The presenters of the shows are teen. Mm -hmm. The show are mm -hmm. teenagers, mm -hmm. and so they review everything, mm -hmm. and they go, "Well, I bring facts and research mm -hmm. and figures, mm -hmm. and then they tell me how it should be crafted." Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. I am no longer a teenager, and even when I was a teenager, I lived in a completely different environment exactly. to Ghana. Yes, yes. And things so for me, change. it was incredibly important because mm -hmm. they are dealing with things that we didn't have to deal with when we were teenagers. You're right. Um, and certain pressures that we didn't have to deal with. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was incredibly important that they had like major input mm -hmm. for it to be authentic mm -hmm. as opposed to this is what I think. You're, as a you're producer, absolutely right. Um, and I'm going to get on with it. No, if the people you are aiming it for, for me, need to play a role mm -hmm. in what the content of it mm -hmm. is going to be like so mm -hmm. that's why i asked about research okay about okay i suppose research. my my re in that case yes i would i do research but it's not formal research it's just conversation just no, having mine is conversation. yes just it's having it, yeah yes often with young people i know or meet i do a lot of reading uh -huh. in school well oh, yeah, pre -COVID. You, do, you do read you used to do a lot of reading in school because uh, i saw it on your website that's I right that's right that's right and then having those conversations with children and young people young adults and finding out what the relevant actually all in the form of a just short a happy chat. conversation yeah. and chats and so forth but you do hear things and you're right they're living in a time that is different from ours. I, I would say that the ch the the, the thirteen-year-old now is probably me when I was sixteen. 
Yeah. Or, or, or when I was 17. Yeah, some of them have seen things. <laughs> I know, I know, because they are exposed to so much more. They have the internet. There's so much information that they share that and, and, we and didn't learn until later. Yeah, and then I think there, there are, can we say, more dangers out there? I mean, they're mm -hmm, having, mm -hmm, to, they're having mm -hmm, to grow up faster mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because we can all remember that when we were kids, we would play out in the street to <laughs> God knows what hours your parents would be looking for you yes. in the dark, but there was no big deal. Mm -hmm. Whereas nowadays, nobody's leaving their kid no, anywhere because, no, no, you no. know? Yeah, but, but, but the thing is, that the, the dangers are often right there in the kids' bedroom with them on their in their hands because they're yes. holding their phones. Yes. And they're... At least our parents knew we were outside on the street somewhere. Yes. But over here, there's a whole world out there in that little device in and, their hands. And then a lot of parents are not not savvy. Not savvy about, enough. Honestly, I mean, my kids laugh at me because I need to put something on Instagram. I, 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 I don't spend a lot of time on social media. So when I have to post something, I often get stuck and I have to ask, okay, so how do I find this? And everybody is laughing at me. No, so you do what I do. <laughs> find yourself a social media manager <laughs> and let them get on with it. I know. Because I tried to do that <laughs> and I think in about six months, <laughs> I was able to get 140 followers and I thought I was doing really well <laughs> posting pictures and putting things up which obviously read the view, you know followers or people who look at the page were not interested in. I know in. I'm so far behind then when I it comes got, to that. I got myself a social media manager and in a space of about a month and a bit I was in the thousand. Yes because because that they that's know how exactly exactly what to do. and if you want to reach young people young adults you need to be in that space yes and that's what i keep reminding myself because really alba if i had my own way i would just write and then hand over the book to my publisher and then move on to the next book but you need to engage with your audience your, yes you need to engage with your audience and that's where i really struggle with that and, and i'm slowly coming to terms with it but it, it's a an area of learning for me and, and, and tough learning because it doesn't come naturally i'd really much rather be writing than be on instagram um connecting yeah. But I have to. But I mean, you also have, I mean, obviously before COVID, the fact that you were going into schools. That's, yes. And so you were then having full access. Absolutely. And then even <laughs> if you didn't think it, it was stuck there in your head. And <laughs> then when you jump up at night, you're doing those notes. Honestly, and it, I love that. I love actually being with my readers. I love listening to them and hearing and just having conversations and hearing what they have to say. And sometimes listening to conversations that they are having amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. there's so much you pick up I mean, yes I mean, my kids are a bit older now so I miss out on all the good stuff but when they were younger oh boy eavesdropping did me so much good <laughs> <laughs> terrible mother eavesdropping <laughs> there at the door with your head next to the you know tuning in so um, before we went for the break and even during the conversation you talked about you know you have your, your notepad there you can <laughs> jump up in the middle of the night and be <laughs> scribbling notes and, and everything so talk us through your process um, maybe you should start by reading something from the lion's whisper. Okay. Um, read a little <laughs> something from <laughs> it and then talk to us about your process. Right, right. Because we know <laughs> why you write. <laughs> Let's talk about how you write. Right. Okay, the lion's whisper is set in 1979. It was a time that I don't think I can ever forget, a time of trauma for me, although I did not personally know anybody who was affected, as in, I knew children and I had friends whose parents were uh, either executed or had to leave the country, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I personally did not have a relative who, was, who, who, who died as a result of that. However, the sound of, of, of gunshots and, and seeing people pictures of people who had been executed and so forth it was quite traumatic for me. So this was a story which had been in my heart for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. Now, The Lion's Whisper is about a boy. My pro protagonist is, is a boy, 15 years old. And in their family, there's they have their enemies who live directly behind them, in the wall behind them, across the wall behind them. And um, it's about the family behind and the family in front and the enmity between them against the backdrop of a, a, a violent and, and, and bloody landscape. Mm -hmm. I'll just read the first few, uh, some lines from the first chapter. Our male protagonist is Leo. And Leo has discovered a little hole in the wall that separates them from the house behind 
he, he's quite curious about it because they don't talk to the people behind them. There's been a lot of history, bad history. And, and, and he moves the stone away. And when he does, his sister's pet, a chicken, scuttles through the hole. And uh, Leo is in big trouble. He has to get this chicken back. His sister is calling out for her chicken cuckoo. And he needs to be indoors very soon. On the other side of the wall, he knows there's a boy his age there. They don't talk. They're enemies as well. Parents are enemies. Kids are enemies. Yes. And um, he's so scared of the boy's father, who is a violent man. But the fact is, the chicken has gone through the hole, the hole that he opened up because he moved away the stone, and he has to get the chicken back. He grabbed the gardener's pruning stool, shoved it against the wall, and hopped on it. He looked into the Zhang's yard and stopped breathing. There, standing on the other side of the wall, was that boy. Those almond-shaped eyes, a disturbing replica of his Chinese father's eyes, looked flatly at Liu. David Zhang's face was expressionless. Sweat glistened off his face and limbs, and his thin shirt stuck in patches to his skin. Cuckoo, the chicken, eyes bright with stupidity, nonchalantly pecked at passing ants in the dust. Leo's eyes swept the unkempt lawn. The Zhang's large black dog stood staring at him from beside the crumbling front porch. It had obviously just been bathed and had been tied to a post to dry out. The dog, the dog gave a single rough bark and tugged at the restraint. Cuckoo, Leo! His sister Isi's voice was faintly carried by the breeze. Two voices in Leo's head. Voice one, don't be stupid. Voice two, <laughs> it's now or never. With a swift movement, Leo leapt over the wall and landed in the Zhang's yard. He now stood face to face with the boy. Up close, David Zhang, though slimmer, was clearly stronger than he was. Taut, sinewy, lean about his middle. This was not the slight child who had got him into so much trouble all those years ago. He smelled of earth and perspiration. The dog barked twice. It strained on its leash. Leo struggled to steady his breathing. He didn't want David to see his fear. A number of empty liquor bottles lay strewn beside the rubble where Cuckoo was contentedly picking at insects and rotting grains of cooked rice. One of those bottles would be a handy weapon of defense if it became necessary. David Zhang noticed Leo's eyes flick to the bottles. His lips twisted in amusement. That would be stupid, Leo. Leo had not heard that voice in five years. It was startlingly deep. He remained motionless, trembling, eyeballing David. Cuckoo, Leo! A car rumbled down the street. It stopped outside the Zhang's gate. Its engine cut off. Alarm bells jangled through Leo's tense frame. Mr. Zhang was home. Diving for Aisy's chicken, he snatched her up and tried to hoist himself up the wall. His hand scrabbled uselessly along the top. He was unable to get a grip. It was too high. The gate had begun to swing open. David Zhang strode forward, snatched the protesting chicken from Leo and hurled it over the wall into the Ating's garden. He dropped on one knee and offered Leo his shoulder. Go, he ordered. Leo looked down at David in amazement. He sprang onto David's shoulder and vaulted over the wall, landing hard on his side. Winded, his breath came out in short gasps. Beside him, Cuckoo flapped around, squawking her indignation at the rude separation from her meal. <laughs> Issy came into view. There you are, Cuckoo, she exclaimed, running up to them with delight in her voice. Cuckoo flapped over to Issy, who turned accusing eyes at her older brother. I looked everywhere for you, Leo. Why didn't you answer me? Leo rose on unsteady legs and brushed off the grass from his clothes. He began to mumble an excuse, but there was no need to. Issy was already heading off to the shade of the palm tree in the centre of the lawn with Cuckoo behind her. He glanced back at the wall with a feeling of incredulity. What had just happened? Sure, he had been braver than he would ever have thought possible, but he could not fool himself. The only reason he and Cuckoo were back safe in their garden was because David Zhang had done something astonishing. He had been merciful. On the other side, David Zhang leaned back against the wall. That chicken had no business being in their garden. If its father had been dead this afternoon, he would have snapped its neck. Mm. Yet he knew why he had done what he did. Ever since he had realized that the wall was all that stood between him and what he wanted most in the world, he had plotted how to get across it, over it or through it. And now this afternoon, the answer had literally jumped into their garden. David looked at the wall again and smiled. 
his hard work chiseling away at the block in the wall had paid off. And in his haste, Leo had forgotten to wedge the dislodged stone back in place. A thick bougainvillea branch concealed it from view. David smiled. He would keep it open. It was a narrow opening, but he believed it was wide enough to help him find what he wanted most in the world. Which was a friend? Um, no. <laughs> oh. Which wasn't a friend, no. <laughs> it was his mother. It was his mother. He um, lived alone with his father and he, he badly wanted his mother. But to know who his mother was, find her. But he had heard something from the Oting's house, just overhearing the housekeeper that made him realize that um, if he became friendly with the family behind, mm -hmm. they could possibly help him find his mother. Um. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so the Lion's Whisper, it's, y you saw I mentioned Leo had two voices. The mm -hmm. Lion's Whisper was about Leo's struggles with himself. Yeah. He, exactly, to do it or not to do it. Which is something everybody goes exactly. through. Exactly. I with really that. actually mm -hmm. liked that device mm -hmm. where that conversation mm -hmm. going mm -hmm. on and then him deciding which yes, way I'm yes, going to Yes, yes, yes. And it's recurrent. It runs through the book. Mm -hmm. And that, 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 that's what's formed the title, The Lion's Whisper. His godfather told him, you're always going to have two voices inside him. His name is Leo. And his godfather yes. said, I knew you were lion-hearted from when you were born. And his godfather told him, you're going to hear two voices. And one of them is a real you. One of them is a lion. And it's going to be a whisper. It's going to be a small voice. But you will know that that's the lion's whisper. Wow. So I, I I love it. It's it's for young adults, but <laughs> any adults can also read this thing. Alba, I'm leaving this with you. I'm taking it. I'm taking it. Make sure you autograph I it will. for me. Okay. So this book, where did the idea come from? Obviously you've got tons of ideas you're writing down. And then just a little bit about the process. What's the spark that sets off the writing process? Um, th there, are, there are lots of sparks that come together to make a flame. And number one, I spoke about this environment that I found myself in in 1979. A young child, gunshots, people are being killed. Odati Wellington is killed. 200 meters from or 300 meters from where I live as a child and I see crowds running in the morning or, or whatever time of day it was shouting and that's a, a sound that can, can never go away. go away because people came back and graphically describing what they saw at the Nima police station I, I lived we lived with my grandmother then and then of course I had friends and you'd go to school and then there were empty desks and I'd wonder so, so what happened where did they go some of them stayed behind and, and you can see life is not the same ever again mm -hmm. but then th that was the backdrop that was a backdrop although the backdrop always forms a big part of the story because where you find yourself obviously will affect what happens to you and it's like the foundation it's the foundation it's the foundation because the, the setting itself is a character it has an effect yes. yes it has an effect on the people in the story and what happens to them so it's pretty much 1979 how did that affect leo's fam the main character's family but then we have david who needs to be with leo so how the the, the unrest and the situation Initially, the boys are pitched together, they find friends in each other, and then they are torn apart again because the bitterness of the past rears its head up. You have heirlooms, family heirlooms of hatred that are passed mm -hmm. down from one generation to another. And at some point, you ask yourself, do I want to keep this or do I want to throw this away? Yeah, yeah. the generational yeah. curses that <laughs> you need to get rid you, you, of. You need to get rid of, and that's a decision that Leo had to make. And it was quite a tough one at the, towards the end because that actually was going to decide whether his father was going to be taken away by soldiers and imprisoned or executed or whether the family was going to be saved. And in the middle of all this, you have the neighbor behind them who doesn't know who his mother was. Now, that, that, the idea for that actually came from my own um, childhood when there was actually a house behind us. We lived in my grandmother's house. It was a large house. There was a house behind us. And there was a ma he was a foreigner. I don't know where he came from, but he was light-skinned with straight hair. And he looked from Asia. Asian yes but I can't tell and and he was a really mean man he was really really mean he had a son who seemed to be just as mean as his father and it was strange but occasionally as children would have a couple of happy conversations over the world but it was usually a lot of enmity amongst us and I don't know why I don't know why his dad he was me picked it up from the adults um, actually, the, my, my parents had nothing to do with them. It, his dad just seemed mean. He was the sort of dad who would yell at children and so forth. 
And I remember once my we had a mango, a guava tree that grew over the wall and onto the roof of their house. And my brother climbed the guava tree and was picking guavas from their roof. And it was an old dilapidated house and, and he fell through the roof. <laughs> yeah, so, and that was so awful. His mom was so angry and it was, it was a big thing. But, but, but you can just think of the hilarity. Of course. It, the man is in his living room, <laughs> sitting, reading his... And the kid, neighbor's kid just drops in from above. It's just hilarious. You know, so there's, there, there's all of that. That happens. And, and so I, I have my own experiences as well, which I thread into the story. Mm -hmm. There's so much that happens either to you or to somebody you know. And it all comes together yeah. to make a story. So it's a bit like... Um, like a collage mm -hmm. really a yes. collage of experiences exactly to exactly build, you know. exactly and the challenge then becomes what do i leave out because you can't put everything in you can't you don't want to over egg the pudding how do you structure are you one of those people that you start writing and you write and you write or for instance i like to create a skeleton mm -hmm. first mm -hmm. and then flesh it mm -hmm. so because mm -hmm. of my film background mm -hmm. i actually like to know where I'm going. Yes, yes, yes. I like that because I didn't, I think that's what I am like now, but I didn't start off like that. I would start off just writing because the ideas were just, you know what they're like, mm. Albert, they're just inside you and they're fighting to get out. So I'm just tapping, okay, I've got this idea for a story, tap, 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 and then tap, 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 and I have lots of chunks of part of what I know is going to be a story and then the challenge then begins okay now how am I going to fit to, all of this together exactly and how am I going to link them exactly exactly and I know it's all part of the story but the story is happening in discrete blocks in my head and and that I think made things a bit challenging for me because sometimes I would have to let certain things go and it was so hard to let them go because it just sounds so right but as you're weaving together the story there's this just great big chunk of story you've written that doesn't seem to fit in and you know what it's like murdering your darlings it's so difficult of course I put it in a file to be used later yes but there's a lot of time spent agonizing over oh this thing needs to fit into the story let me prune it a bit let me squash it in there oh, somehow I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm the complete opposite I'm yeah. ruthless yeah. <laughs> it's like and and that's again from mm -hmm. my film background mm -hmm. I, I trained as an editor mm -hmm. and so an editor you have a ton of footage mm -hmm. and you have a director going but this scene is so beautiful and you're like but it has what's the no point of it <laughs> it has no place it's so beautiful that it throws the sequence off balance mm -hmm. so we need something that is not as amazing mm -hmm. so that th there's equilibrium mm -hmm. across the mm -hmm. and this thing doesn't um, stump out jump out and so I had my editing tutor was ruthless he would sit there rubbish go 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 <laughs> go and so that's how I learned you just learn to look at things in a very impartial manner mm. and say, you know what, we love it, but bye-bye mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and get rid of it without a second thought and move on. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, that's it, something that I have developed later. So initially my writing style was just put everything down because this is all part of the story and then now let me weave it together so it has a good form. Yeah. And then when you have yourself trying to push a square peg into a round hole, you tell yourself, no, no, no. But it can take me weeks sometimes to decide this must go. So over the over the years, I have began to write more in keeping with your style, where I have some sort of outline. I put together an outline, have a rough idea what's going where, and then that way, largely everything that I'm writing fits in with it. You still have to do a lot of trimming, of course, of course. but it's not the you know weeping but over it's, it's four to, chapters that have to go. <laughs> it's better to have a ton and then whittle it down than to you know put things together and think, oh, but there's a gap here, but you know this thing. I think it's better to overwrite to than over to underwrite. I, I think I think my problem has always been overwriting. They're just but then but then everything is there, and then mm. obviously once you have a publisher, mm -hmm. you know they can help you. They can help the editor exactly. The editors editor, are yeah. are key, and that's um, that's one one arm of writing that. I, I really would like to see more of. I, I see a lot of books and, and I wonder how much editorial work has been done on them. So an editor is key and not just not just a line editor, but an editor who is going to look at your story and, and, and give you good structural advice on what could be done better. I've, I've had an amazing experience this no, we're in 2021, so that was last year. Mm. Yes, I've been signed up um, with a literary agency and the editor I was working with Oh my, she was fantastic. I literally had to rewrite the story, but it came out so much better. And I, 
I'm thankful for that. I, I think editors are they're critical, critical. I, I think, um, again, one of the challenges we face is that uh, we uh, certain industries aren't built up. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing, too, is we're also a, a group of people who don't want to offend. And so if you give your work to somebody to read who you feel has some knowledge, they don't want to hurt your feelings. So it's like, oh, well, this is interesting. Well, you know, whereas what you need is somebody who's just going to tell you the truth. Yes. And if you have to rewrite. Mm -hmm. I remember writing a screenplay and sending it to a producer mm -hmm. friend of mine. And I sent him hard copy and it returned back with a red pen mark through two thirds <laughs> two of thirds the of script. Yes, yes. And I just had to, okay, okay, mm -hmm. let's start again. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, you know, it's important to be able to be in a position where you can accept that as yes, an artist. Yes, 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 yes. It's, it's critical. It's critical. You can have the non, non, non formal, informal editors, um, people you know who are who are good readers and who can read and say look i don't know what this is doing here what's this character doing here? this is boring and so forth and then of course you have the properly trained editors who are, invalu and are, are an invaluable part of making sure the story is a good well woven well told mm -hmm. meaningful mm -hmm. story mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. as as you know those listening it's not just you know uh, yeah there's the, the thing of you the one person sitting on your own typing away and getting your story but then after you finished mm -hmm. or done the best you can it moves on to another space another level yes another level where you might have to rewrite but and um, uh, or you get suggestions mm -hmm. and then it gets fine-tuned and it moves up moves up moves yes. up until it's ready for public absolutely consumption. absolutely it's, it's something that i would like to urge any listeners out there who are keen on writing please 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 don't just write it and then take it to somebody to print out and put on the shelves for you it's really important to have a qualified editor a structural editor a line editor look at your work and give you suggestions which can help you make your book the best that it can be and then another thing I also notice are covers, book mm -hmm. covers, because it's like, it's like, you know, when you meet somebody, the face is the first thing that jumps mm -hmm. out. For me, a book cover is also the same thing. Mm -hmm. I go to bookshops and I see book covers and I wonder what, you know, <laughs> what, what was happening when they designed it. Oh, yeah. the, co the cover is key, the cover is, particularly in my field, when you're writing yes. for young people, then they're quite visually stimulated as well. So you need to make sure that the picture is... It's enough to make them want to pick up the book and turn exactly. the page. Exactly. And then the other thing too I like about it is, yes, it's for young people, but it's not childish. Mm, mm, because, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. th there's also that mistake that can mm -hmm. be made. Oh, it's for young people. Let's mm -hmm. just kill it with bright colors and, you know, whatnot. <laughs> because, but then mm -hmm. it be, then it, it, it enters the realm where it's too young yes, for them. Yes, yes, yeah. Because you actually haven't balanced it. Absolutely, absolutely. And what a young adult wants to read about, you, you have to be quite specific with your ages. What a young adult wants to read about is definitely... Not, yeah, not what yes, a child wants to exactly, read. exactly. So, and then making sure that your protagonists are, are the right age as well. Because, you know, nobody wants to be... If you're 14 years old, you probably don't want to read about a nine-year-old. No, of course so not. So making sure that you set that all in there. Now, I know. noticed the protagonist of this book is a young man. Yes. Um, because obviously there's also um, research has been done mm -hmm. about the um, um, protagonists often being boys. Mm -hmm. um, if, if there are girls, mm -hmm. they are being rescued or whatever. <laughs> and, then, and then you go the next level, which is black female. Mm -hmm protagonists mm -hmm. because obviously black girls read and they need mm -hmm. to see themselves represented and mm -hmm. at the moment it's not very good mm -hmm. and so obviously writers are you know taking those things into mm -hmm. consideration mm -hmm. i mean lupita brought out mm -hmm. her book there are lots mm -hmm. of books now with you know black girls mm -hmm. as protagonists mm -hmm. of your books mm -hmm. What's the ratio of gender? Th this was actually the first story I wrote with a male protagonist. Okay. Exactly. The very first one, is Saint in Brown Sandals, had a female protagonist. Uh -huh. Twelve Heart, Dom's Challenge, um, Rattling in the Closet. Exactly. They all had a uh, female protagonist. This, this this was the first, first one, one where I thought, hmm, things are getting a little imbalanced here. Okay. So, okay. so out of the seven books, I have two have male protagonists and five 
because mm. no because i mean not that things are things are maybe getting out of balance for you mm -hmm. but in the greater scheme of mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. isn't mm -hmm. the fact that you are writing mm -hmm. more with girls as protagonists mm -hmm. is actually helping mm -hmm balance the, okay. the the world situation right, right. of the sorry i'm really into gender <laughs> no it's, it's good to know that I'm it's really good to know into, that alba i'm really yeah. into gender yes stuff. Because, no, because otherwise you're you're just stuck in your little cave doing what you do without knowing what's going on outside there and how that can help you um give different perspectives to your writing and just generally grow in your writing as well yeah. and explore because as a writer you want to remain fresh you want to be able to explore new ground and new new topics and and if you don't move out a little bit into unfamiliar territory how do you do that yeah. so it's worth knowing that yeah mm -hmm. I, I i think it's i think it's um um is is really really important mm -hmm. that for me representation mm. and visibility mm. is so important yes. and it's really important specifically for girls mm -hmm. and specifically for black girls mm -hmm. african girls mm -hmm. that they see themselves again example the documentary that i shot it was up in the north and most of the women who work on the farms in the north they pick things and um, you know weeding and mm -hmm. stuff and i remember asking the foreman can I learn to drive a tractor? And mm -hmm. he thought it was a bit weird, but it's like, okay, madam director. Mm -hmm. And I drove this tractor. I learned to drive the tractor. And as I was passing by, I could see all the female workers like looking at you in astonishment. Looking in astonishment. And then when I finished, I said, who wants to do the same? And a group of them lined up and they all took turns mm -hmm. and they learned it. But in their minds previously, they'd this only seen men yes. mm. on the tractor. Mm. It wasn't, if 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 you haven't seen it you mm -hmm. can't be it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so for me it was really important and mm -hmm. then to have those young ladies mm -hmm. jump on and mm -hmm. actually learn and move mm -hmm. it i think it just it, it was it was a little spark of oh my gosh yeah this could potentially yes. be something else yes. for yes. me we we really cannot underestimate the impact of seeing what yeah. seeing does to your belief that this can be done yes yeah. and you know and it just it just mm. amplifies mm. Mm. Your mm. you know that um i can't remember but the first mile the first four minute mile mm -hmm. before then people had said oh we couldn't be done and then after it had been run within a few months of that dozens of people had broken that record yes, yes because, because they had seen it being done they've seen it being mm -hmm. done and mm -hmm. i think it's really important for everybody mm -hmm. to be able to see that things mm -hmm. can be done because mm -hmm. if not we hold ourselves back mm -hmm. and you know those of us in the artistic creative we are the we are the frontier of we can make all these mm -hmm. things possible we've you sitting down, you can make mm -hmm. anything visible mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. for anybody mm -hmm. who reads. Mm -hmm. So, I look, Joel is ready to sleep. Okay, <laughs> guys, listen, I need to sign out. <laughs> Elizabeth, <laughs> isn't it amazing? We could have like continued talking for like... It's been wonderful, of, Alba. So, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for sharing the wonderful world of your writing. I'm particularly passionate about the fact that it is about young people mm -hmm. and it's um, books that are age appropriate and uh, reading material mm -hmm. because they they need all those things they it do. helps them to form and they need to have access and i just think mm -hmm. reading like i think mark it was mark twain who said that um the person who doesn't read is no better than the person, person who, who can't, can't read, read but w can't read absolutely you know <laughs> yes. and and it's really important and so for instance like the work we've done in the readathon the work you're doing in schools the work ruby's doing in school mm -hmm. the the stuff that nana and kofi mm -hmm. publishing and opening up the world mm -hmm. for people to do that the the grotto is mm -hmm. a readers and writers mm -hmm. Um, group where people can write mm -hmm. and read and mm -hmm. listen to readers. I think it's really important mm -hmm. for us as a society to get more people reading. reading. I think you're doing a super, super important job. Thank you, Alba. As they say, knowledge is like a garden. <laughs> if it is not cultivated, it cannot be harvested. Oh. And if you can't go to somewhere, you can read it in a book. The book is a window into... <laughs> Into it is everywhere, everywhere you know and so if you can't go to france you can read a book mm -hmm. about a character who was in france mm -hmm. and you can learn something knowledge can be grabbed from everywhere so 
don't sit on it follow it so at that point thank you so much elizabeth for coming i really enjoyed today thank you for being my first author thank you to alba i had a lovely time and thank you please don't forget to sign my book whipping out my me. pen now uh-huh and so i want to say a big thank you to all of you for tuning in mm -hmm.